Okay, so I'm sitting here in um, Mario's home in um, Chicagoland, and I'm sitting with Lawrence Dickey, who is the designer of Vivid's brand new G1GS Spirit flagship loudspeaker. This is the first, this is a development of the original G1 Geo, which was introduced, I think, in 2009. Actually, 2008. 2008. We reviewed it in for Stereophile in 2010, if I remember correctly. And it has some unique features, both in its bass tuning and in its drive units. And, of course, not the least, because of the way it looks. Mm -hmm. So, to Lawrence, um, you were at Bowers and Wilkins many, many years ago, and one of the projects you worked on there was the Nautilus, where you introduced the idea of using transmission line loading, not just for the woofers, but for all the drive That's units. Right. So with the GEAs, which came first, the drive units with their transmission line loadings, or the base loading, or the form factor, or did all three happen instant well, instantaneously? Uh, as I always like to say, uh, with Vivid Audio products, it's very much a form following function matter. So we um, came up with uh, the particular variation on the bass tuning, um, actually first of all from a theoretical point of view uh, and then tested it out experimentally and then there was a question of well okay um, the theory says we need a, a volume with an attached tapered tube, uh, how are we going to package this? Well at the time I felt that uh, we wanted to make a bit of a song and dance about it, it was not out of place really to show off that we had new right. technology so that really gave rise to the rather distinctive shape of the curly top. Actually in the patent it does include the possibility of uh, what we'd call a re-entrant horn, that is to say you can fold the horn back in on itself internally but we felt that um, discretion could come at some later date. Okay. I mean what puzzled me about the base loading you've de you developed for the twin woofers is that although it's a transmission line it also mm. has reflex vents. That's exactly the point. Um, if you go back to the days of Nautilus, the, the, uh, the invention really um, that is crucial to Nautilus is this idea of using a, an exponential absorber mm -hmm. uh, on the back of the driver. Now that was serendipity. Uh, when Nautilus was first developed, or at least when the, the early experiments um, uh, that I did with, with the drivers with the large hole in the middle, uh, the, the absorber there was just a parallel sided tube uh, filled with uh, fibre absorber. But it was when we came to the base, it was like, well, what the hell are we going to do with a one foot and a bit diameter tube that has to be about three metres long? And right. it, you know, it's quite a large thing. So it was at that point that I said, well, I mean, really, above the cutoff frequency, uh, a horn behaves pretty much like a parallel sided tube. So what would happen if? And that was the point at which I try putting an ex exponential tube on the back of the driver, at first using it as a coupler, so having an exponential tube feeding into a little parallel sided tube and the stuffing was all in the parallel sided tube. And then at one point I thought, well, what would happen if you actually take the stuffing out of the parallel tube and put it in the horn? And it was just one of those things, miraculously, it actually was better than either of the original yes. things. And of course, uh, so yes, that was applied to the base and well, we know the story there, but the interesting thing was that if you try to put a vent on the side of a Nautilus style tube, it doesn't work because the absorber, it's doing its job, it's taking out the energy. Uh, so the base reflex, which relies on a resonance, of right. the so it relies on the spring of the air in the cabinet reacting with the mass of the air in the port, that really fails when you've got. Um, an exponential absorber with a cutoff frequency down in the same sort of area as the port resonance. So the inventive step with uh, gear was to realise that it was actually possible to get the best of both worlds by having the cutoff frequency of the horn at a multiple of the port frequency. We choose uh, about four times. So the important thing is that the horn is uh, the horn admits frequencies at the sort of cabinet eigentone uh, sort of frequencies right. where you get those problems. But down at port uh, tuning, it, it looks pretty much like it's closed off. So yeah. you get port resonance and complete absorption of eigentone. So, you know, yeah, so then you couple that with using two woofers ah. facing each other. Yeah, now the two woofers, uh, yes, it's, um, 
the great thing about using reaction cancelling is that it takes away the need for mass in the cabinet, which of course you know is something we commonly associate um, uh, quality loudspeakers with uh, massive cabinets. I mean, it's such a strong association. But well, Don, right? Because mass, the electrical movement of mass is inductance or capacitance, mm. so you're looking at energy storage. So just because it's massive doesn't mean it's optimal, right? Well, uh, no, you, you need the mass to stop the cabinet jumping around when right. the cones move forward, but you're quite right, it stores energy. If you have a correspondingly very stiff cabinet, then uh, fair enough that you can end up with the uh, structural resonant modes uh, attenuated somewhat, but they're, they tend to be in band. Yes. The, again, the, we, we, uh, we use lightweight composites because when you have a stiff but light enclosure, the resonant modes tend to be pushed higher in frequency and uh, are out of harm's way. Obviously. Yes, yes, they, they, with, with Western, Western tuned music, they're going to fall between the ga gaps between the notes, if you like. <laughs> and the higher you go in frequency, the larger those gaps are. <laughs> well, we, I mean, uh, we like to put them outside to be on the crossover points. Oh, okay. The music so doesn't even come yes. into it. Yeah. Right, right. Now, the, the Abbott drive units, but I remember with the original G1G, looking at the mid-range mm. dome, the upper mid-range dome, it, there was n nothing behind the diaphragm. This, this, this hemispherical diaphragm, mm. metal diaphragm, a ring magnet, and then the back wave was just allowed to disappear into the transmission into the line. That's right. Did was that did that come from a Nautilus or was that? Yeah, that it meant, yeah. The 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 inventive step with the Nautilus, you know, the uh, the use of this uh, exponential um, tapered tube uh, meant that you had to have a nice big hole in the middle of the magnet. Yeah. But at that point, with the Nautilus. Um, we simply used an external annular magnet, which is after all a pretty common setup. With Vivid Audio, I wanted to have much higher flux than right. we'd had with the Nautilus, because for me, it, you have to bear in mind that at that point, um, I'd uh, moved away from BMW because I wanted to get into a professional uh, loudspeakers, studio, studio, studio monitors. Studio, not sound reinforcement? Uh, well, actually I did want to get into live sound, but it's a much more difficult uh, thing to, to, to... The idea of starting a company from scratch, uh, making live sound products is... Actually, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, because the people need reliability, first and foremost. <laughs> and reliability, a well, reputation for reliability comes with with time and really the idea of getting into that starting from scratch was just too much but uh, studio monitoring uh, which also I also found very interesting really that's big hi-fi that's serious big hi-fi and all it has to do is to be able to handle more power <laughs> and produce more sound yeah. and really the crux was just to get more magnetic flux into the gap so yeah. the first thing I did was to get um, uh, my own magnet FEA platform so that I could uh, analyse and optimise the magnetic structure. Yeah. FEA, that's finite, finite element analysis. Exactly. Basically, looking at the magnetic circuit over its entirety by in little segments so that's you can correct. model what's going on. So each little bit is uh, predictable, calculable. Um, and my uh, criteria was to have the big hole in the middle for the uh, free passage of the sound from the rear of the diaphragm, but also I was quite adamant that I wanted to get the drivers as close together as possible yes. because of the vertical dispersion. Whereas if I were to just carry on uh, seeking the sort of flux levels that I was looking for, around about two teslas, um, using conventional annular magnets, they were going to end up uh, maybe yes. 100 and something millimetres in diameter. And so the gap between the drivers would have been just too much. So that was the point where we'd already sort of touched on it before, but the idea of having uh, a radially polarised magnet so that the magnet is actually a cylinder behind the voice oh, okay. uh, allows you to put, uh, frankly, arbitrarily amounts, of, large amounts of magnetic material into the thing. Yes. And uh, so you can achieve, yes. again, the best of Yes, you get, you get the drive units close together, as you can yes. see on, on the um, G1 Spirit. Right. The, the, yeah. the, the, the tweeter and the upper mid-range dome are very close together, so mm. you're not going to get problems in vertical dispersion right. that you often get with, with, well, you always get with loudspeakers which have widely spaced drive exactly, units. Yeah. 
Um, moving on to the spirit, the, the, G, the original G1 Geo was a groundbreaking speaker, very highly, very highly reviewed over the world. Now, what is different about the spirit? I mean, it looks similar. It's a bit smaller, right? Uh, uh, Actually, it's the same internal volume, but, um, well, the reason, <clears throat> the, well, the aspect ratio, as it were, which has changed, because uh, it's become a little wider at the bottom where the base units are, but to keep the volume the same, I've reduced the height. But in a way, I'm, I'm liking the fact that we've been able to reduce the height. Yeah. We perhaps <laughs> set the tweeter height in the original G1 model a little bit high, uh, you know, miracle. <laughs> yeah. But um, it, it, also from an aesthetic point of view, um, the, the G1 was the first, the G2 actually, which was also, it was um, pushed in that direction by the depth of the drivers, right. it should be wider at the bottom and therefore uh, somewhat um, shorter, and so it has much more of a, a, a pair yes. shape. But I remember when I was designing it, I thought, oh god, it's going to look because it looks stumpy or something, I don't know. But when we actually did it, we thought, oh, actually, this really worked. It's perhaps even better than the original G1. So when it came to the G1S, we were pushed in that direction by the deeper base drivers, but actually I'm very happy with the way that it's worked out aesthetically. Yeah. So, but when it comes to why have we changed the base units? Um, well, what is what are the differences between right. the original base units and the woofers in the spirit? Right. Um, well, let me again give a little, uh, little history. So G1, then G2, and subsequently G3. And what we noticed when we moved from G1 to G2. Now I have to say that um, it was perhaps for reasons really quite pragmatic. We're a small company, and we try and have commonality between uh, as many things as as many elements as possible and really it was for as I say completely pragmatic reasons that we use the same motor structure on the base units in G2 and G3 and uh, when in uh, when you put the driver in conjunction with the crossover we found that actually um, it, it wasn't an issue from a, a, um, a, a systems point of view mm -hmm. of the, viewing it as a the, the transfer function of the uh, base unit system it, it, it worked very well in fact it was perfectly possible to have the same motor in all three but what was interesting was that subjectively there was something about the G2 and G3 which actually this is where I have to be kind of careful yeah. because I can't really fully account for why these things happen although the filter functioning the measured response yes. or even the predicted response is pretty much identical between the, all three products. Admittedly, slightly different levels of yes, efficiency yes. and base extension, but there's something about the quality of G2, which was faster, snappier. Yeah. Um, of course, it's, it's kind of a mix-up of terms to say a woofer is faster, but, yeah, but, but I know what you mean. There is more, yeah. you're, you're defining the leading edges of the notes more yeah. clearly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we felt, well, here was a lesson to be learned. And whilst we'd always thought that um, we use the word shove, which is a, a term that was um, developed by John Dibb actually at BMW, and it's an excellent word, it describes shove. completely the shove. It's the um, um, B squared uh, times the volume of conductor divided by the resistivity of the material. But anyway, um, already the shove of the motor on the G1 was what we considered to be high. Certainly conventional loudspeaker theory would tell you that they are overshoved hmm. and uh, rather low in mass, but you know, that was something that came from my time with the professional music field. That there is something about the immediacy of the bass when you have overshoved, underweight uh, drivers, which actually you know, as I say, it flies in the face of some theory, but it actually subjectively works. Mm. So we thought, oh, well, <clears throat> you know, the <clears throat> effectively the G2 and G3 are even more overshoved for their cabinet volume. So we yeah. thought, well, let's just try it. Let's, um, let's build some base units with uh, larger voice coils, larger magnets, more shove, and just see what happens. And, you know, it's just immediately, <laughs> yeah. okay, I can't tell you can't give you a precise reason why, but it just has 
um, uh, something about the way that it, it has control in the bottom yes. end, which is an appreciable step up. So that was a bigger magnet, uh, clearly. Um, okay, in, in numbers, the coil has gone from a 75 to a 100 millimeter diameter. The length of the coil has gone from 12 to 20 millimeters. And the magnetic gap length has gone from 35 to 45 millimeters. So all in all, it's a bigger motor. Yeah, big motor. I mean, that's yeah. it's a doubling in, in the coil area. So it's a yeah. doubling in the power dissipation capability. Yeah, and do, do you use uh, something like the Clipple system to, to, to examine the, the fundamental <coughs> behaviour of, of that driver? We actually have never clippled our drivers, but that's because we clipple. The clipple is an excellent way of um, getting the best out of a value engineered yeah. product, in my opinion. But if you're just um, doing it as right as possible, which right. you know, we yeah. sort of like to believe we do, then it, I, f I feel it's, it's rather less important. We have actually, now a lot of our drivers did go in for a clipple, and it was like, oh yeah, that's yeah. got a very long X Max. Yeah. I mean, the reason I ask is, <coughs> you said earlier, your Vivid, Vivid is a relatively small company, mm -hmm. but unusually for a relatively small loudspeaker company, you manufacture all your drive units. Absolutely. And yeah. it, you don't buy in anything. Other than maybe some crossover components. Well, no, we buy in. <coughs> so we buy in, for instance, the diaphragms from okay. uh, a, a chap in uh, in Devon who uh, has a most unique process. But his is a very small, uh, I would say, cottage industry. But uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's a beautiful uh, little. He's a he's a craftsman. You know, he's a, he has a way of pushing aluminium in a way that other people just don't seem to manage. I mean, certainly when we were, uh, there was a time when um, we weren't quite sure who was going to source this component. And we asked uh, a Chinese manufacturer and they looked at it and said, how do you do that? You can't push aluminium that far. Anyway, so there we go. Um, so that's uh, a supplier. We get our voice calls from uh, another Far Eastern supplier because an edge winding machine we use ribbons, oh, edge round ribbons. Edge round, yeah. as in the old JPL Absolutely. from 60 Absolutely. years ago. Yes. So well, it really works, you know. Put it, it, it's a, you get more conductor in the gas, yeah. and that's what it's about. Well, that's what James Lansing was doing yeah. all that, those decades Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. No, I was going to ask about crossovers. Um, do you use high order crossover filters? Well, some would tell you that they are high order at fourth, fourth order slopes. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, you, you mentioned with the original G1 Geo, we're Seated listener is actually below the tweeter axis. But if you're using a, a fourth order crossover, your vertical dispersion is going to be carefully enough controlled for that not to put the listeners at a disadvantage. Yeah, that's. But but now with a shorter spirit, you're still using high order crossovers. Yeah, I mean, I some time ago, after looking at the various options. I decided that the Linkwitz Riley approach um, seemed to make the most sense right. because of the fact that through crossover the drivers are in phase. So yeah. the lobe, the, cro the uh, when you start to get um, when between the mid range and the tweeter, um, where it's approaching um, the, the wavelength of the sound in question. So uh, you have nulls that go off at, uh, well, in, in practice they're about plus or minus 60 degrees, the first yes. so a good wide window, but I think it's quite important that that should be symmetrical. Yes. And the thing about Linkwitz Riley is because they're in phase of crossover, the lobe is symmetrical, so basically it's pointing straight at the listener. Yeah. Uh, whereas with odd order crossovers, because it's a big uh, fashion for first order filters, that's taking us a single capacitor in series with and, and they are quotes because an actual true first order crossover is, is a rare beast. Well, absolutely, because of course... It, it, because you want the acoustic slope to be first order, exactly. not just a simple electrical first order. That's exactly right, and it's a point that's so frequently missed that actually most of the time you're looking at third order because the driver itself has a natural second order response. Um, it, it's certainly an odd order, that's, yeah. the, that's the point, and, and that tends to put a, a lobe um, uh, either going up or down, but certainly off axis, and so and, and it tends to be about sort of minus three dB on axis. So the temptation is to fill that trough by overlapping the two right. a little more. But what then happens is that you have 
uh, surplus energy bouncing off the ceiling or the floor, usually yeah. the ceiling. Um, and that, you end up having to tweak the on-axis response to compensate for uh, irregularities in the off-axis response. Yeah. And that's something I'm, I'm yeah. uncomfortable with that. I think, I think, I <laughs> we can't pick it up. That process of compromising mm. both to get what sounds right is what yeah. people call voicing the speaker. But to me, it's you're bound, mm. you're messing it up in both both the power response and the direct response yeah. to get something which may sound right in a specific room with specific kinds of music. But it's not a universal solution. That's that's precisely it. it, it yeah, it, it does become uh, application specific. Yes. Application specific. That's a good word. So we talked about the difference in the woofers, Lawrence. And is the mid-range unit the same, or have you done something different there as well? Right, the low mid, that's the 125mm cone driver, that also has changed. Um, triggered by the increased uh, power handling of the base units, I thought, well, we're going from a virtually a kilowatt of capability, thermal capability, yeah. that's what clear about that, on the base units, to the existing 50mm uh, coil on the low mid, that's, that's a bit of a jump. There is a risk there that we're going to uh, have excessive power dissipation on the low mid. Um, so that was the impetus. So I thought, right, well, let's move to a 75 millimeter motor. And then, well, while we're at it, you know, we've put the carbon fiber on the dome drivers and run that optimization. What would happen if we were to actually um, put carbon fibre hoops on the low mid and again run an optimization. So um, we've done that and in fact a new optimum has come up and it's a slightly interesting um, result. So we have a carbon fibre hoop at the neck at the point where the dome meets the cone and another one on the uh, final outside diameter and we've... This uh, is on the... On the the rear side of the, of the diagram. It, it is on the rear yes. side, yeah, it's not, not visible. Um, and we've achieved an improvement. So, so in the original driver, we had a first breakup. Um, well, actually, there was, there was a breakup at 4K, uh, which was very difficult to spot, but it was there. But the first one that really shows on, uh, on the measurements was at 5.8K. The new driver of the first breakup is at 10.5. So again, a pretty yeah. m useful improvement. So yes, increased power handling and increased bandwidth. Again, it's well out of band. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is this is the point when you you sort of go around the loop of taking out the shortcomings, the you know the primary shortcomings, the first level, uh, and then you come around again and say, right, well, what's the next biggest problem? What, yeah. what else, you know, how much further can we push these imperfections out? Yeah, you remind me of when I'm making my live recordings. People say, how do you get a high resolution recording? Well, the first thing is you create a high resolution environment. Yeah. So we sit in the hall and we just listen to the quiet. <laughs> What's that? Oh, that's the air conditioning in the next building over the road. Okay, can we turn that <laughs> off? Okay, we turn that off. What's that? Well, that's the power supply for the emergency lights. Can we turn that off? <laughs> yes, but only after five o'clock when the office is closed. Okay, so we turn, wait till five o'clock, turn those off. And then you go through this iterative loop of listening, <laughs> removing something, and now you hear something else that needs to yeah. be fixed, and you end up with a really quiet hall, yeah. but yeah. Then, then, you, then you reach the optimal state, and actually to press record on the, on the recorder. <laughs> that actually, it, it really does remind me of the original design process, going you know, right back to the beginning of our time at BMW, where you start off with a myriad of folks, and gradually you peel them away, until you just end up with a single glaring resonance. They think, right, where are you from? Yeah. <laughs> and then you would have never noticed it until... Uh, yeah, because it was being hit, disguised by everything else that was going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's, it's vital to take all those layers away. And that's the loudspeaker designer's art, yeah. is knowing, finding out what's happening, and then being able to solve it. Earlier, Lawrence, I said the diaphragm was hemispherical. And now I'm realizing that I misspoke. So what, 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 what is the profile of the diaphragm? Right. <clears throat> Again, let's uh, go back a few years. The, the early work I did with 
developing these 50 millimeter mid-range drivers used uh, a fairly standard spherical cap profile. I'd realized that putting a carbon fiber hoop around the edge improved the performance, that is to say it pushed up the first breakup frequency from around about 11k up to 15, 16k. And this is a 50 millimeter. 50 millimeter, yeah. yeah. Two inches, two inches. Yes. <laughs> um, but it was just uh, suck it and see. I mean, we, we had a, an off-the-shelf component, and we added something which improved it. But it, I, I knew that we could do better uh, if we were to run again a finite element uh, optimization. And uh, when we did so and included the carbon fiber hoop as a constraint in the model, it came out with an, a new profile. But as soon as I saw that, I thought, that's, that's for me. That looks to me like a parabola or, thinking about it, a catenary. Because, of course, a catenary is this very natural shape that you get when you um, support a, a, a chain, a catenary. Is Latin for chain, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but also, it's a solution that has found application in architectural, uh, in, in buildings, in architecture. Uh, there are domes, the Astrodome is a famous case where it has um, catenary uh, concrete, uh, a catenary shaped concrete arch with, I think it's uh, high tensile steel cables around the edge. But earlier, there were other examples where they just had iron chains around there. So yeah. something that, it's always interesting to, to find a solution which actually applies to both a dynamic and a static case. But anyway, there it was. <clears throat> and we built the thing, got some uh, aluminium domes made by my friendly supplier. And sure enough, the performance is almost double yeah. that, uh, that we'd start off with. So we've gone from 11K to 21 22 sometimes, okay. So a really, you know, an octave of difference is a huge, uh, a huge improvement. Yeah. In our, in our Where world. do you cross? Uh, what's the um, upper crossover point? On well, the range we cross over at three and a half k, oh, so, so it's a huge margin. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, well, two and a half octaves. Yeah. It's the first break of it. So naturally, that's going to be with a fourth order crossover. That's going to be what? as well. Then, 50 dB. 50 down. dB down. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's yes. That was the you, you asked me earlier about um, crossovers and slopes, and uh, I had this uh, idea that uh, yeah, uh, you wanted it to be 50 dB yeah. down because it's sort of out of harm's way. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, what I was going to say was that the spirit doesn't replace the G1. It comes in above. The G1, exactly. That's right, yeah. I mean, clearly, um, the, uh, this higher specification um, motor is, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, a, a big extra chunk of material that's yeah. in there. But also, um, uh, okay, we've got uh, outboard, for the first time, we've got an outboard crossover. Now, that is not because the truth be known, I'm not a great believer in having, uh, you know, with it making much difference whether the crossover is inboard or outboard. We've done this, again, for pragmatic reasons. Um, we are well aware that there are active solutions yeah. uh, just around the corner, um, although we ourselves don't have an immediate plan to uh, produce an active crossover under the vivid name. Uh, we have toyed with it, um, but interestingly, we couldn't actually find any advantage over the, our, our passive crossovers. crossovers. Nevertheless, um, having an external crossover with um, a single connector to the loudspeaker does mean that it will be very easy for somebody to make that, um, make that change. So, I mean, traditionally, it was always felt that having the passive crossover in the strong vibrational field from the drive units where you're shaking all those yeah. capacitors, Shaking wires and ductors, that can't be a good thing. But you said that, no, but you didn't find that to be a major issue with your crossover. I didn't. I'll tell you what, I, my belief here is that um, I think that the really important factor in the, the thing that has made people previously uh, uh, find an improvement when getting the crossover out of the box is actually because when you shake an inductor around in a magnetic field, clearly <laughs> you will get an induced uh, current. But because of the particular structure of our magnets, there's very little straight right. flux, 
And my belief is that that's the reason why it actually doesn't make much difference. Right. But we did do that test with the yes. original B1. We, we switched between an internal and external crossover, and we couldn't hear the difference. Well, and with finite, finite element analysis and modeling of the magnetic mm. circuit, you can see before you even make the speaker mm. how much stray field there's yeah, going to be. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's another thing actually with the radial magnet. It's quite funny. Um, it, it was. I was pushed in that direction by the need for uh, a big hole in the middle, a small diameter on the outside, but it's one of those uh, delightful situations where actually um, it also improves its performance in, in uh, both leakage terms and getting flux into the gap yeah. terms. So actually it's a win-win-win situation, which is rather nice, but yes, much, much, much reduced stray flux. Right. Well, thank you, Lawrence. It's been a pleasure talking loudspeakers with you. Absolutely right. And, the, pr and, the, well, and the proof is in the listening, which is what we're going to do this afternoon. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.